when, we've, when we educate patients that are newly diagnosed as diabetic on the potential complications, many times I will mention the chance of developing a Charcot deformity. Uh, I can only imagine, and it has been my experience, that many of these patients will look at me like I'm describing something from a science fiction movie. Uh, it is uh, very upsetting, and it is not something that a, a patient, and as I can understand this, wants to uh, consider. What is upsetting to me is that there are patients that don't get this education. I've had diabetes since 2003. I've had high A1C levels. I've had cellulitis in both feet, um, blood infections due to the cellulitis. Uh, I've been diagnosed with having a heart attack. Uh, I've suffered a triple bypass in 2012. And most recently, I've had reconstruction of my left foot due to the Charcot joint disease. It's been a rough. Yeah. Um, it's been a rough four years. Um, you know, back in two thousand twelve, when he did have the heart attack, that was really um, that was really hard. Um, at the time I was working, it was just very, um, very rough because I didn't have family close by, and you know, it was just, it was hard. It sounds like it was scary. It was very scary. When I first met Scott, he was sent to me for surgical consultation for reconstruction of his left Charcot foot. The first time I laid eyes on this foot, uh, I knew this was going to be a challenge. With Scott, there was also the complication of active osteomyelitis or bone infection that was from all four of his active ulcerations. My foot at the time was no longer underneath my leg, so to speak. It was on a 45. So when I would walk, I would walk on the outside of my foot and develop pressure points. Very, very, very painful, uh, very uncomfortable to walk. His deformity resembled what you would see in a child born with clubfoot. Uh, many Charcot deformities can be the very opposite where we see characteristic rocker bottom feet and what would be an aggressive flat foot position. Scott's deformity was uh, an aggressive high arch position with a foot that turned inward. It all started about four years ago, the problem with my, with my feet. I was coming down rather ill. I experienced a high, very high fever and I had my wife take me to the hospital in Flemington, New Jersey and they diagnosed me with cellulitis in my left foot. My foot was swollen, it was red, and very warm to touch. Uh, they called in a foot specialist and he performed emergency surgery on my left foot to remove the infection from underneath the skin. After that healed and we went to move forward, I had another surgery to remove metatarsal bones from uh, four of my toes and, and my left foot. The doctor at the time felt it would be necessary to help straighten the toes out because my toes were curved down. When Scott first presented, we took an x-ray. What you can see on this x-ray is the absence of the entire fifth metatarsal, which on this bone model represents this bone. What you can still see is the fifth digit, his fifth toe, floating in space with no bone supporting behind it. Just on my left foot alone, I've had about nine or 10 different surgeries uh, from having different cases of cellulitis in my foot um, and just other surgeries like removal of the metatarsal bones in my foot. And these were all complications of diabetes? Yes. What you can also see in this model, excuse me, in this x-ray, is that the metatarsal heads were removed from the fourth, third, and second, what we call ray. And here is a full bone model that shows those bones present. 
Scott's foot was also turned inward and down, so he was bearing weight on the remnant bones on this side of his foot, including this bone, which is called the cuboid. Tremendous stresses were placed along the soft tissue envelope on what we call the lateral side of the ankle and foot, causing ulcerations at his ankle, ulcerations at what was the remnant cuboid, and also at the fourth metatarsal, which was remaining. He also had localized chronic bone infection at those areas of ulceration. I had a hole in my left foot on the top, probably about from pinky toe to second toe of my foot. And that was an ulcer, diabetic ulcer? Yes. It exposed tendons and, and everything, and tissue. My first appointment with Dr. Rocchio was supposed to be just a consultation to go over a possible reconstruction of my left foot. Um, at which point, when he walked in the room, his words to me was, I don't like the look of that foot. He looked at me and he says, you're going to the hospital. Your foot is infected. There was not only deformity and chronic bone infection, but he also had an acute cellulitis or soft tissue infection. Uh, this was concerning because of these wounds that were down to bone, his deformity, and his compromised state. We were able to clear his cellulitis and then have this patient uh, discharged and managed and set up for his reconstructive surgery. I was diagnosed back with type 2 diabetes in 2003. It was about seven years later I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. My father has diabetes. He's also uh, insulin dependent. Uh, my uncle, my father's brother, he had it and, and me. It's been, it's been rough. Um, I was very concerned with him, you know, when he had his um, heart attack in 2012. Um, it's just the two of us. It was rough, you know, me as to living alone. Um, he was away. I was by myself and um, didn't know what to do. And so luckily I had family and support with me. We were both active. We both liked doing things outside, going to different places. Uh, going to see family members for long weekends, uh, travel. And now, for the past four years, I've been just going to doctor's offices, in and out of hospitals for the last four years. Um, my health being the number one concern and fighting through it. It eats at you. It, it consumes your life, basically. The procedure itself was very lengthy. We had over eight joints that we needed to reconstruct and fuse. Using a combination of internal hardware, such as screws, and uh, in this case, we used something called an intermedullary nail to stabilize that rear foot, that ankle, and the heel bone. An intermedullary nail is a large, device that looks like a large nail or a large screw with no threads and it is used to lock the calcaneus to the bone that sits inside the ankle joint, the talus, and then will fixate them into the long shaft of the bone that's your shin bone, your tibia. What Scott also needed was a significant stabilization of all of the joints that run along the inside of his foot, something we call the medial column. So when we count those joints, there is three main joints from the bone that sits in the ankle, two small cube-shaped bones, and the long bone of the first metatarsal or at the great toe. What we did there was we used a large screw 
to fixate all three of those joints with one device. To use both the nail and the ankle and what we call the medial beaming screw, we are then able to use what I think is the most valuable form of fixation and stabilization, and that is the external fixation multi-planar device. Scott wore this device for four months. With this device, we not only can get compression and continued adjustment should there need to be uh, outside of the operating room. We can correct this device in a clinic setting without needing to take Scott back to the operating room, compromising him with anesthesia and potentially exposing him to hospital acquired infections. While uncomfortable to think about, this foot sits in the model like this and there are wires that extend from the area of the ring, travel through the bone and att attach to the other side of the ring and are fixated and tensioned to give it its stability and strength. I came home with an external fixator on my, on my leg and I had that removed and I would say complete recovery about four months. To keep it fresh in your mind, I'm showing Scott's preoperative x-ray. And again, the model of what we call a rectus or normal foot. When we look at Scott's postoperative x-ray, we can see that the large intermedullary nail that I described is in place, fusing the subtalar joint and the ankle joint. Looking at this ankle joint, we can see that this is wonderful fusion and excellent consolidation to a point where we can see no more joint lines that we would see present in this sawbone model. This large screw represents the medial column beam described previously. What we also see is one, two, three of these joints are fused. He now has a foot that resembles the rectus foot showing all of the bones of the rear foot, the talus, and the calcaneus, the heel bone, in wonderful alignment, and also the bones of the midfoot fused and the bones of the forefoot in wonderful alignment. Like I said, he came a very long way. Um, he is a miracle. If it wasn't for Dr. Rocchio performing the surgery, um, he could have lost his foot, and that was basically the last resort that he had and he would have to have a prosthetic. I would like to appreciate him. I would thank him, um, bottom of my heart, for everything that he has done and that he saved my husband's foot. And if it wasn't for him, I don't know where he would have been today. He'd probably be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. He'd probably be in a prosthetic, and he would have to learn how to walk again. And, you know, I want him back to normal like we used to do. This patient really was offered amputation of this deformed left extremity, which uh, in many circles is not uncommon, uh, especially with such severe deformity, bone infection, and multiple failed procedures to remove prominences but not address the main deformity. Uh, these patients often will be told by many specialists that there is no other option but removal of this leg. and. Many times this is painted in a, in, a, in a picture of you can get your prosthesis and within months you'll be on your way walking with no concern in a prosthesis. Uh, in Scott's concern, Scott's situation, uh, that was very difficult to imagine as he also had a noticeable Charcot deformity of his contralateral right extremity. Diabetes is very serious. It consumes your life. It takes your life over if you let it. You need to fight. You need to know your body. And you need to go to the doctor and get checked out periodically. It's very important. It doesn't just affect you. It affects your whole family. What I hope for Scott is I hope that we can look for things that could be problems in the future, small areas of rubbing in a shoe, uh, and catch them early, fix them. He's, uh, he's got adequate blood flow, so we should be able to uh, have this patient return to life and, and get moving and, and, and be able to once again go on vacation with his wife and, 
and enjoy uh, enjoy the things that you should enjoy in life.